So we have had a bit of controversy in the championship this weekend as well as discussing all this weekend's action we will also be previewing the games going on in midweek as well. Let's go. So guys, welcome back to the Championship Roundup. A lot of talking points to go through in today's video. As always, get all your thoughts in the comments down below as to what you made of your team's performance. Like I say, we've got a couple of controversial decisions that went on this weekend to talk through. And we're also going to be predicting what we think will happen in all the midweek fixtures that we have going on in midweek. So a lot going on in the Championship at the moment. Before we hop into it, though, a big shout out to our sponsors over at OneFootball. As always, you can find the new OneFootball app in the top line of the description down below. Really handy football app to have as we do have so so much championship action going on at the moment. If you want to keep on top of everything, One Football is the place to do that. If you want to get live updates to your phone whenever a goal goes in, look into a player at your club in a little bit more detail with the underlying stats and numbers so far this season. I always find that quite handy. And before we do hop into anything, I will include your guys' score predictions on screen now. So fair play to everyone who did get a score prediction correct. I had a pretty decent week myself. I got a couple of them right. I was happy to get the North End prediction right. And if we also take a look over to the prediction league as well, I've managed to move up one place in the league and we got a couple of other people who have made it up into the top 24. So I'm knocking around in the top 6 at the moment which I'm pretty happy with but obviously all that could change come midweek so if you want to get involved with the prediction league leave your score predictions in the comments down below for the midweek games. But without any further ado let's hop into talking about these matches. So we'll start out with Friday's game which saw Forrest draw one all with Derby in what was quite an entertaining game in the end. I thought we all thought that it would be quite a closely contested one but there ended up being a little bit more goal action than a lot of us first thought it was Martin Waghorn who gave Derby the lead with an inch perfect free kick in off the crossbar. Derby probably have some of the best set piece takers in the league in that squad, you know. With no Wayne Rooney available for this one, Waghorn stepped up, but they also got Tom Lawrence in that squad, who we've all seen put away free kicks before as well. So just brilliantly taken. Forrest did get back into it though through Lyle Taylor. We asked the question before would Chris Houston go with both Taylor and Graben up front, or would he drop one in the end that he went for that partnership? I'll be interested to see if he sticks with that through the season or if he does go back to one up top. But of course the big controversial moment from this game came from the Josue goal which was ruled out for Martin Warcorn being in an offside position. Now if you're a Derby fan you're going to argue this one way, if you're a Forest fan you're going to argue it in another. And I can see it from both perspectives, you know as a North End fan I've been on both ends of this sort of decision being made and I think because there is a level of subjectiveness to this one you're never going to get a hundred percent definitive answer as to whether this was the right decision or not. Can I see why this decision has been made? Yes. At the end of the day the linesman sees Wycorn in an offside position and he doesn't have the sort of depth of view to see where he is in relation to the ball from where the linesman's standing so he's going to put his flag up. But Derby fans will be kicking themselves from that perspective but overall it was a much improved performance from Derby from what we've seen of them so far this season. Much more intensity about them. I like that midfield that they had in this game. The 4-3 worked quite well together. Graham Shinney was really busy in midfield. He actually had one fantastic chance to make it 2-0 to Derby, which could have seen this one go in a whole different direction, but Bryce Semba saved well from that one-on-one. -on -one. So, finishing is a one-all draw in the end. Not the end of the world for each side. Next up into the early kickoff, we had Watford playing at a one-all draw with Bournemouth, where there was more controversy in this game as well. Lloyd Kelly goes in with a really rash challenge on Sartre just a minute into this game and I think he gets away with one here by the fact that the fouls committed so early on into the game and the referee is a little bit more reluctant to get out that red card because on any other day if that's committed you know 10 minutes later on into that game it's a red card every day of the week and I don't think many people would disagree with that one. Watford do take the lead and it's a really well worked goal quite similar to one of the goals that they scored against Blackburn. Craig Cathcart switches the play brilliantly to Sar. He then whips the ball low into the box and Parikh is there to make it 1-0 to Watford. After that there were a couple of other chances to make it 2-0 for Watford. Begovic came up with a couple of saves, but Watford are, so far this season, have set up to be this really frustrating side to play against who don't give away all too much to the opposition. However, when you are playing on these sort of one-goal leads, like Watford have with a few of their matches so far, there's always the danger that Bournemouth are going to creep back into it. Now, the controversial point of this one was that Lloyd Kelly had a hand in setting up the equaliser for Bournemouth in the 95th minute, and there's the argument to be saying, should he have been on the 
pitch at that point? Probably not. But in that second half especially, Bournemouth were persistent and that paid off. Chris Mentham with the goal, like I say, in the 95th minute to level this one up. So between the two relegated sides, there didn't end up being too much in it. After that, we have Bristol City and Swansea playing out a one all draw. Given the circumstances, I don't think that's a too bad of a point for Bristol City, really. Swansea, I think, are a side who set up well away from home. They did ask Bristol City a couple of questions before they eventually took the lead and it was some great football in the build-up to that opening goal. Connor Roberts with the final pass to slip in Jamal Lowe and he takes it with his left foot and smashes it into the roof of the net. It is then Connor Roberts who gives away the penalty which was a bit of a controversial talking point from this match. I think even Dean Ashton's admitted the Bristol City manager that had that decision gone against him he'd have been pretty upset. He had have been pretty fuming if that was given against Preston but Naki Well steps up to take it makes it 1-1. After that Swansea did have a couple of other openings going forward. Gurkhead's almost made a goal for himself which would have been an absolute worldie but that one just went wide but like I say Bristol City they bounced back from that defeat last time against Borough and I think they'll take the point in this one but Swansea will probably be quite frustrated. Next up to Cardiff against Borough these two cancel each other out in what was again decided by set pieces quite unsurprisingly so Middlesbrough took the lead thanks to George Seville who seems to be the real man on form for Middlesbrough at the moment. Two goals in two for him that goal maybe came a little bit against the run of play after Cardiff were keeping Bettinelli on his toes for that first half but it was a little bit of a drab one it did open up a little bit more going into that second half where Bettinelli would continue to be put under pressure by Cardiff Harry Wilson had a decent chance Volks had one great one which was saved by Bettinelli but Cardiff got back into it thanks to a set piece of their own Middlesbrough probably a little bit disappointed in the way they conceded this one because it came from sort of the second phase of play in that set piece Ojo getting on the end of it he's been quite the sign for Cardiff so far this season that's his second goal but in the end the game finished level at 1-1 which probably wasn't all too surprising really with the way that Borussia are up away from home they make it very tough for the opposition and do have those moments going forward I think they're both set up for fairly solid seasons it's just a question of can they get that bit more of a spark in the final third to really push forward after that we then have Blackburn putting four goals past Coventry Blackburn back within the goals now we did mention this in the preview to this game if Blackburn played at the same intensity going forward like they did against Watford I think we all back Blackburn to score a few goals in this one now Coventry weren't helped by the early red card. Rose being sent off after just 14 minutes. A push in the back of Ben Burton. It was a red card. And in the end, Adam Armstrong tucks that penalty away. From there on in, it's going to be a tough afternoon. Being 1-0 down, down to 10 men against a side like Blackburn. And it was in the second half when Blackburn really started to boss this one. Some of the goals they scored, like the attacking intelligence between that forward three and that midfield was something else. Armstrong's goal, brilliantly taken. Harvey Elliott got in on the act as well. Ben Burton had a large part to play in both of those goals and he won the penalty as well but the pick of the goals that Sam Gallagher goal the build up to this one between Lewis Holtby and Harvey Elliott was absolutely something else like it was two really nice flicks from both of them the ball falls to Gallagher in the box and he finishes well into the near post but Blackburn like I say back up and running now after a couple of dodgy results next up we then had North End beating Huddersfield by two goals to one so obviously I was happy that my prediction came true for this one but gotta say I was really impressed by Huddersfield it was a stark contrast to the game that we had last season when it was a boring nil-nil draw. Both sides set up to defend in that one. That was not the case in this game. It ended up being like a bit of a basketball match. Just going back and forth between each side attacking. It really was something. It was Huddersfield who started out as the better of the two sides. Alex Neal went for a back three to match up Huddersfield and it took us a while to settle into that shape. The first sort of half an hour of this game. Huddersfield were all over us. The intensity was there from their two fullbacks getting forward. Great goal they scored. Lewis O'Brien with a pass which cut open our defence. Fraser Campbell latched onto it to make it 1-0 to Huddersfield. There were a couple of the decisions which I found a little bit strange in this game. I thought we should have had a penalty and there was the argument to be made that Brad Potts could have had a red card for quite a rash challenge in that first half as well. But heading into the second half, this is when Preston really started to get into our stride. Alan Brown scores two fantastic goals. The first one, bending effort into the far post. And then the second one, after Ben Hamer botches a ball that comes into the box from Joe Rafferty, he improvises really well to hook the ball over his shoulder and find his way past the goalkeeper. And then when the game was 2 one it just absolutely exploded I mean you can see by the stats to the side of me how many shots each side had in the end this game could have ended 5-5 or something like that
anything like that. It really was just back and forth. It was the most entertaining game that Preston have been involved in so far this season. I think that's fair to say. And Huddersfield had a couple of chances to get back into it. You know, Pippa had one effort which was well saved by Rudd. Sar's red card, I think, was an obvious one. Emil Reese was racing throwing goal when he decides to take him down. So I don't think that Huddersfield fans would have had too many complaints about that. But even down to 10 men, Huddersfield were still going for this one, trying to get back into it. But speaking of Emil Reese, this was an absolute worldly of a performance from him in terms of bringing others into play. The amount of hassle that he caused this Huddersfield defence throughout the 90 minutes. He completed more dribbles than anyone else in this game. His movement off the ball was absolutely excellent. He pulled the Huddersfield defenders into these uncomfortable positions and he was so unlucky not to score at the end. He had a shot crashing against the crossbar. But I think that first goal is only a matter of games away because the way he's playing at the moment he is just what we've been lacking recently. But great for Preston to pick up back-to-back -back wins but Huddersfield there were quite a few positives to take from that one. Millwall up against Barnsley this one finished 1-1. Quite a bit to talk about for this game. There were a few mitigating factors going into it whereby Guy Rowett had to pull out of it due to a positive COVID-19 test and Barnsley were missing a couple of players that pulled out from injury in the warm-up to this one. Both Jordan Williams and Coley Woodrow suffered injuries in the warm-up so had to be taken out of the squad and it was a bit of a weird first half really. Millwall didn't quite seem to be on the tempo that they usually are and Barnsley took the lead a fantastic strike from Alex Mo on the stroke of half time 44 minutes into this one. It was an absolute world of a hit. Bilkowski some no chance, but that lead was to last just a moment of minutes before Millwall equalised just before half time. Jeet Cooper from the set piece situations is always going to be a massive handful. He makes it 1 1. And going into the second half, Millwall probably got a little bit unlucky not to win this one with some of the chances they had. Barnsley still had a couple of openings. Herbie Kane normally scored an absolutely audacious free kick, but Millwall came close on quite a few occasions. They were really threatening from these wide areas, getting balls into the box. Kenneth Hall had quite the impact when he came on. But the big news for Barnsley is that they have finally appointed a new manager. Valerian Ishmael comes in. I think we were all anticipating them to look into the foreign market. It's been quite a long time coming for, the, for them to get this manager over the line. But a fairly young manager, only 45 years old, has been in charge of over 200 games so far where he's got a fairly decent win record, 54%. Throughout his career so far, he's worked in Germany, Austria and Greece. So we'll wait and see how this one turns out over this season. But I think it's good that Barnsley finally have someone in place now. Next up then, we we had Norwich beating Wickham by two goals to one and Mario Varancic continues to be the super sub coming off the bench to rescue Norwich City in the dying embers of this game. Now, when they took the lead after just three minutes, really well worked goal. It was a lovely ball in from Buendia outside of the foot pass into Timu Puki after just three minutes. You're thinking then that Norwich are going to run away with this one, but it wasn't the case. It was a bit of a miscommunication at the back which led Wickham back into this one. Grant Hanley and Tim Crow, I'm not sure what they were doing really, but Wickham make it 1-1 and from that point onwards, they were always going to make it difficult for Norwich. You can see by the amount of chances in the possession stats for this one how the general flow of the game went as you'd expect really. But it was Mario Varancic with an inch perfect free kick which went on to win this one for Norwich in the end. Now the controversy comes from the fact that was it a free kick in the build up to this one? No it definitely wasn't. I think that Varancic buys it completely. And there were a couple of decisions that went against Wickham. I've seen them appealing for a penalty in this one for Fred on Yudima. Having seen it back I don't think it was a penalty really. I thought it would have been quite soft. But Norwich are a team with these quality players who have the know-how about them. And Mario Vrancic ends up being the hero for Norwich once again. Adam Eder does get a red card late on in this one. So he's now going to be missing their next few matches. So not as comfortable as Norwich would have liked, but they got the job done in the end. Next up, we then had QPR against Birmingham playing out a goalless draw. Probably one of the most unsurprising results of the weekend, really, given Birmingham's lack of goals so far this season. Each side actually not winning since the opening day. Birmingham actually now the only side in the EFL and Premier League not to score from open play so far this season. That's some stat, to say the least. But defensively, they look, you know, resolute as ever for this one. QPR looked a little bit lacklustre once again going forward. They improved slightly after the break, but never really to the extent where you would have said they should have had a goal. Birmingham probably had the better of the chances going forward. Scott Hogan did have the ball in the back of the net, but was ruled out for offside. Things just don't seem to be clicking for Scott Hogan at the moment, do they? You know, pre-lockdown compared to post-lockdown Scott Hogan seems to be a different player for Birmingham. But like I say, with some of the chances that Birmingham had in this one, they'll maybe be a little bit disappointed that they didn't go on to win. Next up, we then go to Reading as they put three goals past Rotherham as they continue this impressive start to the season as as the weeks go on, Reading are getting more and more convincing now. The way they play is interesting because they do so well without the ball that they don't rely on having a lot of possessions in order to create chances. That was the case in this one where Rotherham had a lot of the ball for this one but just couldn't really look to open up Reading who have been so good defensively so far this season. Obviously another clean sheet but the goals really were quality in this one. The first one brilliantly created by Ajaria, some nice footwork from him. He then 
picks out Mate at the far post. He puts it in under the goalkeeper's legs. The pick of the goals was the second one, though. An acrobatical sort of bicycle kick from Yaku Mate, who can come up with these real moments of quality, can't he? And then Lucas Joe goes on to make it three for Reading, winning a penalty and then dispatching that one off the bench to make it three. And now Reading, after seven matches, sit top of the table on 19 points. It really has been an excellent start from them so far. I think their next game up against Blackburn is going to tell us a lot about them because obviously Blackburn have been this sort of free-scoring, fluid team going forward. If they can pull off a result there, I think we may have to start taking Reading really seriously this season. After that, we then had Luton beating Sheffield Wednesday by one goal to nil, and you have to say it was a brilliant away performance from Luton. The way that Nathan Jones set his team up for this one, I think he got it spot on. It's a trend we're seeing more and more in the Championship these days to set up with three at the back. I thought that Luton used that system really effectively. It allowed him Panzu to get forward a lot more. He was involved in a lot of the good things that Luton were going moving forward. And even before the red card and they took the lead, it was the away side who had the better chance in this one. Danny Hilton had a good chance cleared off the line by Aidan Flint and Panzu had a one-on-one -on -one which he put wide. But it was moments after that red card for Van Aken, which was a little bit silly. It was a high foot. He was quite late. I can see why the referee's given that. That and Panzu takes his chance really well, shows his composure, doesn't rush at the shot. And even after they made it 1-0, they had, they had other chances to go on and seal this game off. Now, for Sheffield Wednesday, I think they are missing some key players from the start of the season. You know, Luongo's a massive miss in midfield. I offer at the back to another big one, and they've got a couple of other injuries at the moment. Sheffield Wednesday's next two games are up against Rotherham and Wickham. Those are going to be massively defining in their season for me. And then to finish things off, we had Stoke beating Brentford by three goals to two. Now, there were quite a few people in the comments down below last time that were back in Stoke, and I did fancy them for a point in this one, but absolutely excellent, and Tyrese Campbell really is the man of the moment for Stoke. He was absolutely ripping Brentford apart in this one. They couldn't contain him. He and Fletcher linked up really well for the first goal, quite similar to how they did against Luton. He then had a hand in setting up the second one for McLean, and then the third one he scored himself as an absolutely pinpoint finish. I think what makes him so dangerous is he's got so many attributes about him. His attacking intelligence, you can see, is really there. The way he dribbles past people, he can go on either foot. He's got real pace about him. Only 20 years old, he's had six goal contributions so far this season. We've got a lot more to come of Tyrese Campbell, I think that's fair to say. But Stoke ends up making it quite difficult for themselves. They threw a couple of goals away late on. Brentford have an interesting conundrum at the moment, where by they have two really informed strikers in both Force and Ivan Tony as well. So I'm interested to see if they look to accommodate both of them into a system moving forward, whether one of them plays off the shoulder of the other out wide, or they do switch up the system a little bit. But guys, there were all the matches that went on this weekend, so do get your thoughts in the comments down below as to what you made of your team's performance. In terms of my results of the weekend, I'm going to give it to Stoke for that 3-2 victory over Brentford. Really impressive stuff. And then for my goal of the weekend, I'm going to give it to Yaku Mate for his second acrobatical goal against rather and brilliant finish. So get your thoughts on that in the comments down below, but now without any further ado, let's head into my midweek score predictions. So do get your predictions in the comments down below for a chance to be involved in the next video and get yourself onto the prediction league. So Barnsley going up against QPR, I think I'm back in Barnsley in this one. QPR just haven't quite hit the same heights as they had at times last season without a win since the opening day. Have seemed to be a little bit limited going forward. I'm going to back Barnsley for a 1-0 home victory in that game. One of the biggest games we've got coming up this weekend then sees Blackburn going up against Reading you'd expect this one to be a really interesting one Reading's at the top of the league don't give away many goals Blackburn have been free scoring in some of theirs so it's going to be attack versus defence who's going to come out on top I've got a feeling that Reading may continue this trend we have seen Blackburn come unstuck in a couple of home games so far this season both against Cardiff and Nottingham Forest who play in a similarly resilient way that Reading have set up defensively so far this season you know each of them are good without the ball Going to go 2-1 Reading in that game, although, like I say, that really could go either way. That's a flip of a coin. Brentford against Norwich. I'm going to go for a 1-1 draw. Two sides who have it in them to play some really nice football going forward this season, but neither's quite clicked into gear yet. Middlesbrough against Coventry. Coventry will be looking to bounce back from that game at the weekend against Blackburn, but Middlesbrough are a tough opposition to go up against. I'm going to go 1-0 Borough in that game. Swansea versus Stoke. Don't see all too much being in this one either. I'm actually going to go for a goal that's drawing that one, although I wouldn't be too surprised to see Michael O'Neill pull some out and get an away victory, but Swansea at home can be a little bit hit and miss, but I'm going to go for a goal that's drawing that one. Wickham against Watford. Going to go 2-0 Watford. I think the away side will have too much in that game. Into Wednesday,
Wednesday's games, we didn't have Preston going up against Millwall. Now, we have seemingly got our season going with two back-to-back -back away wins. However, our record at Deep Dell so far hasn't been great, and it's been up against sides exactly like Millwall, who we've really struggled against so far this season. Teams who are happy to sit in, they're going to be a little bit physical, and they're going to be a real threat from counter-attacks and set-pieces. I've got a bad feeling about this one that we could fall into the traps of making the same mistakes like we did against Stoke, Swansea and Cardiff. I'm going to go 1-0 Millwall and hope I'm proven wrong in that one and that we can get our first points at home of the season. Birmingham against Huddersfield's a tough game to predict because Birmingham, although haven't been great going forward so far this season, also don't give away all too much to the opposition. But Huddersfield, I was quite impressed by at the weekend against Preston. I think that the intensity that they play with, they will cause Birmingham a couple of problems going forward. I'm going to back them for all three points in that one. I'm going to say 1-0 Huddersfield. Bournemouth up against Bristol City. I think I'm fancying Bournemouth in that one. I'm going to go 2-1 to the home side. Bristol City haven't quite had things going for them in their last two matches. And I'm fancying Bournemouth to get back to winning ways in that one with a 2-1 home victory. Derby up against Cardiff. Going to go 1-1. Derby, I thought, were much improved at the weekend. But Cardiff are a resilient opposition to go up against. Luton against Forest is another interesting one. Because Luton were brilliant against Sheffield Wednesday. It was a game plan which was executed to perfection. But I think Chris Hewton might be able to pull something out of the bag for this one and they will pick up back-to-back -back away victories. I'm going to go 1-0 Forest in that game, although I could easily be proven wrong. And then finally, we see Rotherham going up against Sheffield Wednesday. We mentioned this while talking about Wednesday. It's a big week in their season as they face two of the promoted clubs. For this one, though, I'm going to go for a 1-1 draw. Sheffield Wednesday with a couple of the players that they've got missing from that squad at the moment don't seem to be themselves while they're not at full strength. So as you can see to the side of me, those are my score predictions for what I see happening in midweek. Do get your predictions in the comments down below for what you see happening. But apart from that, that will now wrap it up for today's video. So thanks so much for watching, guys. If you did go in to enjoy, make sure to leave a like. And please do stick around and subscribe for a bit of regular championship content. But apart from that, thanks for watching, guys. And I'll see you all in the next one.